tell the customer what you think they should do. Be credible, be somebody the customer trusts, and then say to them, this is what I think you should do. If it was me, this is what I'd do. I'd buy this, and this is why. Hello, and welcome to Inward Book Club, the show where periodically Michael and I sit down, read a sales book, and bitch like hell about it. This month... This month we're going to fall out horrendously. It's all going to kick off. This month on the show, we are talking about The Jolt Effect, which is written by... Matthew Dixon and Ted McKenna, best-selling co-author of The Challenger Sale, that book that you all talk about but none of you have actually read. They all talk about Challenger and you go, all right, tell me a little bit about Everybody's it. Everybody's a challenger. They just like, like I always said about that book, it was just well-titled. Uh, as is this. Uh, we'll discuss that. Great we'll discuss branding. That. Uh, 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 challenger was a study in form over function. Well, let's see what we think about the jolt effect, yes. Jonathan. Yes, so how have you got on with this one, Mike? Yeah, I didn't like it. Do you want me to read you my... And su- there ends the show. Thank you very much ah. for listening. Well, it's going to be an interesting show because Johnny likes it and I don't. Yeah, I'll, I read, think... I'll read to you what I've put. Oh, I'll take, on. take you, the cover off. Ahead. Let's read what I put. So this is the first page just in the jolt effect and I wrote a little message around it. Okay. And the message I wrote is... This book and method is perfect for those who are poor at generating a pipeline full of opportunities where the prospect has pain they really need to fix. If you want to sound like you're busy with clients but not actually bothered about closing deals, this is a great book for you. Now, I can see your face, Johnny, so we're going to find out, aren't we? And we're going to talk about it. Uh, So that's that's a pretty harsh initial commentary. Uh, I'm on the preface, which is page X1, and there's a couple of things I want to bring up. Okay. So I'm on the preface here, Mike, which is on page X1. Preface uh, for our American preface. listeners. Yes, preface, if you're in America. Um, and they talk about, if there's one study that is the envy of every sales researcher, it's the groundbreaking work done by Professor Neil Rackham and his team, as profiled in the book Spin Selling. It took 12 years to complete, 35,000 sales calls observed, 116 unique factors, did it, and more than $2.3 million in today's dollars spent on the study. And the point he makes about this book, and this is what I think is fascinating about the book, is, and I think this is a really key point, advances in big data analytics, machine learning, and GPU-powered processing have made it possible to study much larger data sets and to consider far more factors than Rackham's team has had. And what they're basically saying is that the basis of this book is based on recorded transcripts of thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands of actual sales calls and sales pipeline items which have then been put through machine learning and from which we've actually got some really interesting data yes and i think the first point i got out of this and the the thing that's excited me about this book is i think that we are walking into a pivotal moment in the history of our profession okay i mean a, a seminal moment in the history of the sales profession. And what I mean by that is the technology now is going to give us extremely clear understandings mm. of what does and what doesn't work and who does and who doesn't sell. Okay. And I think that the next few years, for us as recruiters, Mike, my first thought was, this is absolutely monumental for us as recruiters. The, and it is never really, you know, I understand we've got... What, these, the collection of data is monumental? I, I understand we've got these sales tech tools now. You know, we use HubSpot. I make HubSpot calls. I record my calls. It gives me a transcript. It gives me some initial data, how much I've talked, how much I've listened, da 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 da, da. But then when you actually start thinking, well, there are other c- companies now who are running really clever AI and machine learning over huge data sets Mm. of sales meetings. Mm. The implications of that for our game, let alone the sales game, Mm. because actually now, if you're a smart organization, and this is much, I'm jumping ahead to much later in the book, if you're a smart organization now, the way you hire salespeople is going to be very different. That's a whole topic, Johnny. A whole different topic because 70, 80% of the people who are out there recruiting, I want somebody from a direct competition. <laughs> I don't know how to hire for skill. That's a, just a different show. 
Should we do it again? I'm going to put them down the competition. Yeah. <laughs> what about somebody who's good at doing the job? Yeah, but they don't know the VAR channel. What about if they've got the skills to do the job? Oh, but I want them from a dynamic competition. <laughs> yeah, that's a different thing. <laughs> want them with a black book of contacts. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. So let's so let's look about so, the the. the says, so I just thought for me that one, I, I, I just it turned my brain on. I just thought, yeah, wow. I mean, I get, I, get, I, 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 I get your point. I, I really, I mean, it sounds cynical, but I really don't think it'll change the way in which people hire. But that's a separate topic. Isn't I do it? think it's going to change the way people sell though with this one. I think I think it's going to change the game. What this book? Yep, not the book, the study, the fact that they've been able to create as good a study as they have, and the underpinning methodology that they use to create the study, I think, will in the next two to three years. As the tech gets better, cheaper, more available, and easier to configure and manipulate, will completely change the entirety of the sales profession. So, can I can I give you a, a, an example? Because you're a keen golfer. Yes. Okay. So, I think I don't watch that much golf. So maybe I'll watch the Ryder Cup or maybe the the Open or something like that. I think we've. Uh, I guess we've done a lot of analysis on golf swings, and all the golf swings are pretty much similar now. There's a set of things. There are the, certain things, the set of things that are right to do to set up square, we club know. angle, club, club plane, club, club, club speed, club path, club face angle, and all yeah. of that, and that, and that is a hundred percent correct in sport. I'm sure the stats on rugby league and NFL, on Premier League football, on all the sports there, yeah, maybe even on dance. I'm reading a very interesting book about maybe, the use of big data in football. At the so moment, there we go. So, but at some point, what's going to happen? We've got this. If it was in a, if it was economics, we'd say we've got perfect information, and then we're going to become perfectly competitive. And actually, all the sports people, broadly speaking, um, swing the club or kick the ball or have the team play, and broadly speaking, a similar way. My personal view is what that will then create is an army of salespeople who, broadly speaking, are clones. You know, you look at some of the big software companies; they just hire young, middle-class, well-educated, good-looking people. They do. Mm -hmm. And then if you take those young, well-educated, middle-class people, and then you say, right, we statistically have found this is the way to do it. Are those people capable of learning how to do that and repeating the process? Yes. And repeating what perfection looks like. Okay, so we're agreed on that. Yeah. And then so we're agreed we, so that we... So we hire for coachability. We, and we've created this workforce... Uh, wherever Microsoft, SAP, Oracle, whatever, where all the all the all the salespeople are doing the right thing at the right time, they're they're set, they're asking the right questions because they're beautifully trained and they've got prompting software, and that's great. And let's say I'm BP and I'm going to buy some ERP software, and I meet a salesperson from SAP. Bear in mind, SAP have got the same data about selling as Microsoft. Mm -hmm. They've got the same data about the client. And they've they're got all the going to be jolting the client. Or, or whatever the current trend is. Yeah. And then I meet a salesperson from Microsoft, pretty much the same, similar thing. And then I meet a 52-year-old fat Seve Ballesteros from Oracle. <laughs> I think that's where it's leading. I think the Seve Ballesteros seller... The flair salesman. Just something just different. Just something about him. Just something different. And that is... The je ne sais quoi. And I, that, you know, that's not about this book. That's more about a your point. Seve. <laughs> But you know, you get what I'm getting at. A Miguel Angel Jimenez. Yeah, or Have a Jim. Have you ever seen him? Yeah, or a Jim Furyk. Yeah, okay. Or an Ian Woosnam. Yeah. Or a, a bloody white shark. Uh, what? Uh, uh, John, John Daly. John Daly with a can of lager and a fag. Metaphorically. And I meet these two perfect 27-year-olds who both had a year out in Cambodia building a school. And then they <laughs> swallowed the sales book. And they spoke, speak perfect English. And they know which knife and fork to use. And they say please and thank you. And they never interrupt. And they follow the, sway, the same thing. And they smell perfect. And they've driven there in their Tesla. Then all of a sudden, John Daly parks outside in his Ferrari and goes, yeah, let's just scrap all that stuff. Do you want to buy some software? Com comes outside in his Ferrari with, a, with his arse cleavage. His and he docks his fag. His fat belly making, no, a, fat making man's, a fat man's fold and, over and his that, trousers. And that, I think, is the dynamic in sales that will always exist. Because I don't like it when people go, people buy from people. But actually, they do. And that's my problem with your point about the data. But we are going to, you know, in the same way that Formula One is data-led, and as we said, soccer is data-led. You know, I use all Ar sports. Are. I, I use Arcos Club sensors. All, all sports Every, are data-led. You know, the data in the Arcos database now, 
I think they're into something like 800 million golf shots. So, you know, they send articles out like, mid-handicapper, should you use a hybrid or a seven-wood? The data's just clear now, you should have a seven-wood. End of. Clear. It's not even a, well, maybe this, maybe that. It's because, yeah, there's the data. Go out and buy a seven-wood. Get rid of your hybrid. You'll, you'll, you'll probably find an extra shot next year. But you know what? I'll have more fun using a two-iron. Yeah, I know. And try to convince yourself. But as the great Lee Trevino said... Uh, what what do you do in a lightning storm? Hold your one iron in the air. Not even God can hit a one iron. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's talk about the book. So, so, um, so the introduction, it says, it, it, in our research, we found that anywhere between 40 and 60% of deals today end up stalled in no decision limbo. And, it talks and I about think that's your pro. objection to the that's book. That's my massive objection about the, the book. What the hell are all these people doing getting involved with customers who weren't going to buy anything? Oh, boss, I've got this customer. They're stuck. Okay, go and find someone else. Put oh, some more stuff in the top. Well, of what about this book I've read, The Jolt Effect? I can change their status quo. No, go and find someone else. Oh, I've got this candidate. Um, they're perfectly happy in their job. Great, I'm going to find someone else. Correct. So I've got this candidate. He, he just doesn't want to leave where he is. I'm going to find someone else. That's the most. I often look at these books, and I and I often think about. Uh, I try and think about them from the perspective of our clients. I always try and think about a book from the perspective of a candidate. Yes, who's in the in the role as a salesperson, and I always think about them from my own perspective, as a, a salesperson, as a salesperson and a director of a recruitment business, and somebody who is still in reality on the tools day in day out, and absolutely, oh Mike, this candidate, don't, don't, he, I can't believe it. He says he's going to stay where he is. Well, Good, find another well, candidate. I, I think you'd say two things to me. You'd say, Johnny, what the hell were you doing, engaging with him in the first place? Yeah. I think uh, it's very rare you call me out on anything. I think you'd call me out on that. 100%. You'd say, what are you doing dealing with somebody who's, who's not looking for a job? That's the first thing you'd say. And then the second thing you'd say is, well, if you've got enough in the pipeline, you won't be worried about it. Yeah, what about the other candidates you've Just got Just get in more there? stuff at the top of the funnel. So I get your point, and I, and I, and I get why that's frustrating. And that was a really you. bad start. Now, the remainder of the book, we're going to talk about it at some point. Um, there's some good stuff in it. I don't, I don't dispute that. But the... Fundamental thing that made that my real problem with it is, oh, we're dealing with these buyers that want to maintain their status quo. Find just find someone else. I think that's very easy for me and you to sit here and say. It's easy for the candidates, they're yeah, but the it's salespeople. Not, it's not though, because what if you work at Oracle and you are Bill Smith, account executive for FSI, and you've got twenty allocated FSI accounts? Yeah, that's it. There's your 20 accounts. What, they're not going to buy anything? Go make me my $2 million or whatever it is of ARR next year. Go and get another job. I would leave. 100%. Assuming that Bill Smith decent has been there a few years and all the rest of it, and then Bill Smith gets these 20 accounts that, as far as he can qualify, there's no money in unless he can do the jolt effect. I'd say, right, boss, I'm either leaving or I want to sell somebody else. I'd do net new business. That's what they get paid to do, Mike, isn't it? They get paid 110 grand, 120 grand, 130 grand basic salary to actually get a customer to do something that they wouldn't ordinarily have thought of doing. In fact, they get paid to influence the customer to behave in a way that is different to their current behaviour, notably to buy off them. I agree with part that partially. They get paid that, and then they get bonuses, and then they get taken to club, and then they get... Treated like kings. Go and work for someone else. Hundred percent. I tell you now, if you're listening to this, not if you work at BT, but if you're listening to this <laughs> and you're or computer centre, and you, <laughs> you see how many times we can get sued. Or, <laughs> but you, you know, if you're at that point where you've got to try and persuade, if you've got to try and persuade the client to who's got pain to buy off you, not your competition. Yes, hundred percent. That's your job. That is your job. That's your job. That's your job. To persuade the client that you're the right supplier, the prospect that you're the right supplier. If, however, your job is to go and persuade some somebody to try and buy something for which they've got no need, get a new job. But I think that a lot of clients would say to us and a lot of candidates would say to us, well, actually, that is the job. And maybe in some industries, maybe in the new ones like AI, where nobody really has a use for it. You know, you look at, we have that client uh, that was in the AI space. It, it, a lot of those products that are paradigm changing. Oh, you mean that client that had loads of VC, bought, uh, hired, million, loads of, hired loads of salespeople, and now he's a skeleton crew? <laughs> oh. And now, play, now has an office big enough to play football in. Oh, yeah, great. That worked brilliantly for them. <laughs> yeah, but 
that cell, that's a cell that is very much, you, you, you've got to change your paradigm. And when you're getting paid loads of money to work in these sort of companies, you get paid to change the paradigm. You get paid to change the way the customer thinks. And you get paid to get the customer to get excited about something they didn't know existed. Apple Vision Pro. Yeah. None of us needed it. Yeah. None of us need it. But did it address a pain? No. Doesn't What pain have I got that means I need Apple Vision Pro? So come on, Johnny. I actually don't know what Apple Vision Pro is. So what is it? Apple's new augmented reality headset. Right. It retails at the princely sum of three and a half thousand US dollars. Okay. And pre-orders went online last week. What does it do? It creates augmented reality. So not quite. What like could a you use it for? Could you use it for maybe? Could so you could sit now, put your Apple Reality Pro on, and you could have. Could I be here in Apple e Reality Pro? Yes, you could be talking to me, so, and so you could also see your email app, the, your Mac. You could have the TV on and you could be talking to me and I can right. see your eyes projected in a screen through the thing. It's nuts. So what? So, let's, so this is my point. Nobody needs Apple Reality Pro. But does it solve a problem for me? No, not really. It does. I don't want to drop, leave my house and I'm scarce on time. It solves two problems for yes. me. Yes. It have addresses to to, and a you problem. Have to, you'll never have to go to the pictures again. You'll be able to It, address, have a it addresses a problem. Now it, now, it does it in a new way. Yeah. But I have got a pain. You know how much I hate leaving my house, Johnny. I yeah. whinge about it all the time. So in reality, uh, and and like you and I are having meetings, all right, I get your point, because actually you're going to go, well, actually, Johnny, it's seven grand, but we don't have to have an office, and you and I can have meetings in absolute reality uh, without ever leaving our houses. Oh, yeah, and it paid for itself in two months. That addresses the problem. Yes. Then it's a bit all like right. it's a bit like the cartoon of the Gatling but gun salesman. But none of us needed an iPhone. The iPhone was a solution to a problem none of us had. Do you think? Yes. Or do you think it? Or don't you think it addressed a problem of image? It was a solution to a problem none of us had. So my point. It was a fashion item. Yes, it was a fashion item. We and the moment we saw it, we all bloody wanted one. It's like these Stanley water bottles. Does it address a problem? Oh, it's a water bottle. I've got a water bottle here. Mine was fourteen. Anyway, we really my, talk... my, mine was fourteen ninety nine. We really need to talk about the book. All right. So, so what we're saying is though, and Johnny and I are obviously disagreeing about this to start with, yeah, but no, that's, that's good. good. No, we don't. We've gone off on a tangent. But, and I think what we're saying here is, you're saying the book's useless because actually, in reality, if you've got enough in your pipeline, it doesn't matter if the customer gets stuck with indecision. 100%, that's my point. I'm saying some people don't have a choice but to try and convince people who are stuck with indecision because actually they don't have the freedom of choice of just sticking some more shit in the top the, of the funnel that you and I have. The only way I'm going to caveat myself and disagree with myself slightly is a lot of the enterprise salespeople that we place have invested 12 months in a sale. Correct. And they can't just walk away from it. Now, and I do agree with that. And often that deal is do or die, isn't it? it their careers depend on it, their commission depends on it. Yeah. So, so, so he's given a number of reasons here as to what makes indecision such a dangerous threat what chapter are you on i'm on page xv1 oh god we... <laughs> this is good it's good we, we haven't even got into book yet <laughs> keep knocking yeah, the yeah. microphone well, you, you're into diary of a ceo some of his shows are three hours long uh i've never watched them i'm just reading the book i don't want to watch it and joe rogan he goes on for about four hours and i'm funnier than him <laughs> come on what's your point <laughs> right <laughs> joe rogan i really dislike joe rogan um so they've got a number of reasons about why it's such a threat. Customer indecision is driven by a separate and distinct psychological effect called the omission bias, which is the customer's desire to avoid making mistakes. I found this very interesting, actually. And then they point out, customers, it turns out, are much less worried about missing out than they are about messing up. That's a really interesting point. Yes, I do and agree. And that's come completely. out of the data. Because we've all thought that actually the way to sell is, well, if the customer's going to miss out, you're going to miss out. You Standing listen. room only close. Standing room only. And they talk about this, how most salespeople defer to FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. <sighs> yeah, well, we can only implement next month. But actually what the data is saying is it's driven by deeply personal fear of screwing up, particularly no, in those larger, more high involvement. Point. And it says, as the number of options available to customers increases, as the amount of information available to research those options expand and the cost and risk of vendor solutions continues to rise, so too does the propensity for customers to become indecisive and ultimately do nothing. And what the book and the pointing out is, actually the biggest competitor you've got is do now. 
Mm, mm, mm. not other suppliers, which is interesting because actually I think that does reflect to us as well as recruiters, you know. Mm, I think that... Mm, do I agree with that? Client of mine, Good point. just before Christmas, met him at the Big Data Show. Probably going to listen to the show and I've actually got a meeting with him later today. But where did I end up with it in the end? I ended up with it in Do Now. Yes, he didn't hire anybody. I wasn't. It wasn't a competition thing. We did a bloody good job. We put some brilliant candidates in there. I know the candidates you had, didn't you? I mean, world class, some of those guys. Yeah, I completely agree. But actually, before Christmas, we were battling it out. It was a bit intense. Client ended up in do now. They've hired nobody. Not hired anyone. Did you ever get into any form of loss analysis or understand the reasoning of well, it? I've got a call with him today. But it, it, that happens. It happens in recruitment. It does happen. The do now is a very powerful competitor. Mm, interesting. It's, we've got two buyers, haven't we? Clients and candidates. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Like that. So then what they're pointing out is this, and they've, they've given us all the explanations about how customers are f afraid of messing out. Then they go, together it forms a new playbook, which we call the JOLT method, that is purpose-built for overcoming customer indecision. My note here has been, this will be the conversation and all our clients will jabber on about it for the next three years. What, the actual method, the jolt method? We Well, we get a lot of job specs now, don't we, where the customer's job spec is. Candidate must be a challenger. Um, we do. I, th I think your market is subtly different to mine, actually. My, my, my market, they seem to want a bit more blunt instrument. <laughs> I'm not knocking Rather it. Rather than surgical tool. Yeah, but I place people on big basics, so it's yeah, not yeah, yeah. it's not knocking yeah. one market over another. Uh, I, I get a lot of that. Yeah, I really need somebody who's a challenger. Get a lot of that. The next three years, every job spec, I guarantee it, the clients are going to say to us, candidate must be a jolt guy. A How do you think that differs then? Because you focus on, maybe let's say, healthcare and analytics as two core markets. I suspect those two cohorts of sellers are quite different really well what's really interesting is a lot of what this book talks about in terms of actually how to jolt the customer into decision and later on in the book we'll talk about this more they talk about um basically telling the customer what to do next and asking the customer for their business and then telling the customer this is what's going to happen next after you've done it and this is how it's all going to pan out because I think that's what Gillian does brilliantly. Very good at that. She's very assertive. Mm. Uh, I think there's two challenges, and we'll talk. I'm going to talk about this more later on in the show. One, you know, public sector. <sighs> <laughs> I tell you now, you meet very few salespeople capable of doing this who sell in public sector. And I know we're going to alienate a big cohort of people who sell to councils, but I don't care. Very few good ones. David Cole. Oh, superb. See, David Absolutely. Cole what a top is a guy. private sector sales guy who has lived in higher education and public sector his whole life. Comp 100 and as a result, agree. has earned a fortune. And has got a good career and sells and closes and has, stuff. Correct. Top track record sells and has closed stuff and is a top guy. David would say to a customer, right, here's what we're going to do next. You're going to raise an order. I'll get it sent to you. You put your signature on it. I'm going to bring my guys here on Monday and we're going to start the project. They're going to look after you and it's all going to be all right. So get the paperwork done. You, have you started it yet? Completely and he'd say good. it in a nice way with a big smile on his face and the customer would go, okay, David, yeah, good idea. And the customer doesn't get buyer's remorse from that. He's just got that drive. He, he pushes the sale along. And, what's and it's not aggression. I agree with you completely. And they, they, they later on, there's a really interesting matrix in the book. Of, of sort of a pushiness matrix where it, 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 it talks about it. And what's fascinating is I think in certain sectors, the percentage of salespeople who have the capacity to do that is minuscule. Completely agree with you, yeah. Minuscule. I, I, and I mean, I, I'm on a real thing at the moment about how people interview. And a frustration for me is, I've noticed more than at any other time in my recruitment career, the percentage of candidates who close in an interview properly 
who actually get to the end of an interview and say, okay, right, we've been talking for an hour. Let's just do a summary of what's happened in this meeting. You told me you were looking for the following things. One, two, three, four. Oh, yeah, I mean... I've, and I've covered those by explaining to you the following things. One, two, three, four, five. Is there anything else I've missed out? No, great. Is there any reason why we won't diarise this for a second appointment? That's all they've got to say and they get a second interview. Is there any reason why we can't diarise this for a second appointment? No, great. When can you do the next appointment? Um, I don't know. Okay, well, I'll wait whilst you find out. The percentage of candidates that do that is at the lowest since... I've since ever records been began. Since I completely rec- agree. Since, I mean, I'm 25 years into my recruitment career. This is an all-time low. It is a source of immense frustration. And the irony particularly is the ones that get the jobs are the ones who do it. Um, but my going back to the point about the jolt effect, and I'm, we're going to talk a little bit more about it, is in the sectors I deal in, the volume of candidates and salespeople who are capable of a lot of these jolt type activities is minuscule. And so I think the impact it's going to have on the industry is enormous because one clients are going to start hiring for joltability. I think there's a word they use and later on in the book, they talk about it, um, about hiring for capacity to jolt. Mm. And two, I think it's going to, as the data comes out and people start building a more data-driven approach to managing salespeople where calls are recorded and the data does throw up whether people have asked a closing question in a meeting. You know, they no longer need a sales manager sat next to them in the meeting. No, they don't. All of a sudden, some sales enablement person is going to be making big decisions about salespeople here, and I think it's going to push a lot of people out of the industry. Great for us, me and you. Demand's Mm. going to stay high. I could, yeah, you're right. I, 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 um, I agree with you completely. It's it, it's fascinating, really, when you think about it. Right, so, what what page are you on? Because I feel like I feel like you've hardly got even got involved in it yet. A couple of other bits. Well, it doesn't matter if we take time here, Mike. Chill. Forty-four percent of you deals. Know, in, I'm not a person that wants to maintain my status quo. Forty-four <laughs> percent of deals that end up lost to inaction are due to the customer's preference for the status quo, either not believing that things are bad enough to change or not agreeing that the vendor solution represents a more compelling alternative. But 56% of the time, the customer expresses a desire to abandon their status quo, move forward in a way the new vendor solution, but for one reason or another, is unwilling or unable to make a decision and commit. Some really fascinating stuff. And then they talk about how they did the research. Um, Well, I like this bit, actually, in fairness. There are three reasons why a customer might experience indecision. Go on, what are those? They're worried about choosing the wrong option. Yeah. They're concerned that they haven't done enough homework. They fear they won't get what they're paying for. I mean, that just applies to the IT industry, doesn't it? Of course it does. You know, every single one of the people we work with has had a customer that's bought something completely shit. We've, well, <clears throat> we've done it. Well, yeah, I mean, look at the AI space. I think there's a lot that that market must be struggling with a lot of the first-time purchases that clients made Yeah, where it didn't work where now somebody's actually got a really good AI solution and the client's out there going, yeah, I've bought one of them before, it didn't work first time around. Look how long it took us to bin Salesforce. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Purely out of fear. Yes. Out of fear. And they put the FUD on us every year come renewal time. Hard. Yeah. Really hard. And then we left and nothing happened. We didn't die. We didn't die. It was hard. To be fair, I took my eye right off the ball in yeah, other hub- areas. HubSpot's great. But now, on the other side of it, there's no what's way it, what, I'd regret that. What's purchase. interesting about that is, I think this time around, you'd more easily been HubSpot if something else came along, because you are now used to the change and the fear is lessened yes. in you. I'd be much more ruthless if HubSpot started screwing up. There yeah. are bugs all over HubSpot now. My confidence in making a big system shift is much higher. Yes. If that makes sense. Mm, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Um, There's a a couple of bits here. When buyers pass up or miss out on their dream home, it colours their perception of every other home they look at. Even in absolute terms, any of these other options represent a better situation than the buyer's current housing. I wrote The Ghost of Candidate X. Yeah. How often do you get that where you put Candidate X in front of a client, the client absolutely falls in love with the candidate, but they don't get to hire them. And I always say, oh, God, oh, shit. We're going to be living with the ghost of candidate X here for the next two months. And two months later, they haven't hired anybody because they're still sitting there hankering after the ghost of candidate X. Mm -hmm. And you're like, yeah, he's off the market, mate. He's gone. Well, can you find me another? No. 
you should have hired him when you had the chance. And you didn't hire them. So if I find you another, you're probably not going to hire them either. Yeah, because you couldn't pull it off. Right. So are you are you actually into chapter two yet? I'm not. I'm on page 11, which is about the inaction paradox. Just they talk about Daniel Kahneman and Tversky's work, don't they, about how people prefer to minimise loss than to maximise gain. Yes, and they've got a little People graph. hate losing much more than they like winning. That's a very true of me, actually. Mm. It's fascinating, that, isn't it? They hate losing more than they maximise winning. But as a salesperson and as a finding, it's very easy to skip over that as we read the book and go through the show. People hate losing more than they like winning. But actually, as a salesperson, that's just a huge learning, isn't it? Yes, it's and, the, it. and what's amazing about the book, and I know you hate it, is actually the data is saying people are using more to be, than they To be clear, it. about the book, it, the book is like having a Betamax video player and only <laughs> being able to get VHS cassettes. Most of the book is excellent. Yes. I, I would have just stopped at page one when it said, when we're, we're, we're talking about trying to sell to people who weren't going to buy anything. Yes. And therefore, I'd just ditched the job. My effect. issue with it is it, it, it pads out a lot where it could have just said, listen, point one, people hate losing more than they... I mean, I get your point. On, the, well, on this point, you know, it's, uh, it's a very interesting The whole point. people hate losing more than they like winning. And this made me think of the whole thing on the TV recently with the Horizon scandal. Yes. They spent a billion dollars, didn't they, on that software? I don't know. Yeah, it was about, I think they spent about a billion quid on it. And they hate the thought of losing and admitting that it wasn't right was so great that they were prepared to let people go to prison. Mm, yes. I mean, that's extreme. When you think of it that way, mm. the thought of having somebody at the post office having to admit, we've really screwed up here. Well, so they covered it up and covered it up and everybody covered it up because nobody wanted to be part of that team that said, this has been a terrible purchase. Well, it's interesting. So I, I write down affirmations every day because I'm weird like that. And one of the affirmations that I write is, try it today as if you're going to go out of business tomorrow. Yeah, that's very. It's quite a stoic thing, that isn't it? The Stoics talk a lot about doing each thing as if it was the last time you were ever to do it. But I think there's a lot, lots of good in that mindset. Mm. You know, how many salespeople get carried away with themselves because they have five years with a company, they think they're absolutely mega, then they get a job above their station, and then they have five jobs in five years. Yeah, loads, loads. loads. Yeah. Chapter two. Are we actually onto the jolt effect yet? We're getting there, Mike. I feel like a child in a Three car. Three purchasing errors of commission, valuation, lack of information, outcome uncertainty. The last bit, outcome... So they, they, what they talk about are the three reasons why people are indecisive. And then he talks about the silent killer of sales. They call it the carbon monoxide detector. A staggering 87% of all conversations in our study showed either moderate or high levels of customer indecision. Wow. And then what they talked about is unhandled... Very interesting, this page 23 as a key influencer of indecision, are unhandled objections. I mean, I'm going to sigh, because obviously that's the case. Which occur in nearly 70% of the sales calls in our study. It's a toxic combination, more often than not, a recipe for inaction. I think lots of people just gloss over objections, hoping they're never going to resurface. They sidestep them, don't they? Yes, completely agree. Where we found low levels of indecision in sales conversations, we found win rates in the 45 to 55% rate. Just a moderate level of indecision drags win rates down into the 25 to 30% range. Where we see high levels of indecision, it's down to 5%. And they say apparently the number one killer when a customer says it is, I need to think about it some more. This phrase, statistically speaking, is the kiss of death. It is actually, in fact, far worse than being told no. I need to think about it. Apparently that is the end of a deal from the stats. What do you think when a candidate says, I need to think about it overnight? You've lost, haven't you? I don't think you always have. I think different people buy in different ways. Yes, they do. I talk about this, I, wrote, I made a lot of notes on this later on, which is they don't talk about, in NLP, they talk a lot about people have strategies for doing things. Yeah, exactly. So... Many years ago, in the days when we used to interview people face-to-face -face, and every candidate got an hour and a half of our time, mm. one of the first key questions I used to ask people was, tell me about a purchase you made recently, a big one. Do you know, I always used to say, when, when they took a job that they were leaving, 
as you say, tell me, how did you decide to take that job in the first place? Correct. I used to often ask them that job, the last job you took, how did you decide that that was the right job for you? Yes, it's a brilliant question. And then what I used to do is I used to use an elicitation method to actually work out how they did it. So some of them would say, well, I asked some friends, right. So they have a, a, a social just... frame of reference. Oh, yeah, then what? And then I looked online and did some studies and I looked up on the glass door. Right, visual does research. So he talks to people, then he does research. Mm. All right, and then what? Oh, well, I... Uh, then I looked at the website and made sure I liked the look of the website. Right, and then he likes to so say he's got an auditory, auditory, visual buying strategy. And then what I would do is I would often present a job by saying, why don't you talk to some of your mates about this company? And I would map those buying strategies in order to best present jobs to people. Completely agree. Now, what the book doesn't do and what their point is saying is that it doesn't allude at any point to actually buying strategies. And actually, like you say, everybody has a different way of buying. At no point does it uncover how people are going to make a decision. How how does that customer buy? All it says is, well, lots of deals get lost because the customer is indecisive. Well, why do they become indecisive? Well, they become indecisive because they get scared of making a bad decision. I actually think it's much deeper than that. Actually, it's because the way that it's sometimes been sold to them doesn't map the way that they buy. 100% agree. Psychologically. My other issue with the book, as I read it, was it doesn't talk enough about a complex, multi-stakeholder sale. I don't have a problem with that, really. It'd make the book just too three-dimensional, I think. But why? Because it's almost saying, oh, yeah, all the enterprise deals now are just done one-on-one. Is that so? Am I am I missing something? No, well, here? you're exactly right. I completely agree with you, but I think it would make the book too complicated. But you think about the challenge of the way that was written. That didn't cover enterprise multi-stakeholder selling. And I wonder why that is. I think different people have just a different frame of reference in terms of how they think uh, and are, write things. Or are deals less complex now? I think is, I, is SaaS sport in a less complex way. So it's sold in a less complex way a lot of the time, isn't it? Think about how Salesforce is sold. More stealthily, I guess. Mm, I think so. Anyway. Okay, I think I might actually be on chapter two, Mike. You'd be oh, pleased thank to God know. for that. Chapter two, the jolt effect. So what do you make of this one? Uh, I like the fact that we go through the jolt method. Judging the indecision. And this, I know you're going to talk about this. For, well, there's two parts that, that, that I think are really, really important. It says, judging the, uh, the indecision... Offering your recommendation, I took notes on my laptop, as you can tell. Uh, limiting the exploration and taking ideas off the table. I think offering your recommendation and limiting the exploration, they're two really important things. Yes. So just explain what the book means by offering their recommendation. I mean, I'm going to paraphrase the book awfully, but it means at some point the seller's got to tell the client what's going to happen and what they should do. Yeah, effectively. Uh, when working with customers struggling with valuation problems, concerned about picking from among what seems like equally attractive options, we found the approach most salespeople take is to rely on needs diagnosis. These reps defer to the customer and use a bevy of questions to try and surface what's really important. But high performers know that customers who are indecisive I this, yeah. are looking for guidance, not choice. And so they take a decidedly different approach. Rather than asking confused customers what they want, they instead tell them what they should buy. Now, I think that, as I said, Mike... That is the best bit in the book. I think that's a seminal moment in the history of our profession. I won't go that far. I'm telling you. It's a game changer, that. All those years of all those salespeople... No, Jonathan, it's, it's consultative sale. You've got to listen to the customer. And you sat there thinking... Yeah, you seem to have had 10 I, I, jobs I, in 10 years, you. <laughs> uh, and yet I don't think it's a game the, changer. I think it's validating something you have believed. Yes. Quite whether... Because I think the, I think in a lot of the sales books, the, the clients and salespeople know this stuff anyway. They just sort of do it. And if you've got a good track record of three jobs in... Three employees in five years in new business sales, you're doing all that. The good ones just get on with it anyway. They just tell customers, right, I think you should buy this. Your wife does that. She ain't going to read the jolt effect. No. She won't even listen to the show. No. Last thing she... she needs to spend another hour listening to me next week. But point is, does she need to? No, because she does it anyway. Yeah. And the good ones just do it. 
naturally. Yes. They don't need training on it, really. They just decide, right, I want this customer to buy this software, and I think this software is right for him, therefore I'm going to tell him to buy it. Yeah, correct. But I think there's a large part of the population of the audience that finds it very difficult to tell a customer what to do. I think do that's quite... Because we've actually... We've created a social... Filled, we've filled them so full of fucking Kool-Aid about being consultative. I think we f we fill not just salespeople, but the whole population. Yes, we've Hun filled them so, so full of this nonsense Kool-Aid that actually the thought that they would walk into a meeting and say, right, Mr. Customer, I t I've got an idea. You're going to do this next. Well, do you know what's interesting? So, honey, in a kind way, with a smile on your face, with the best interest of the customer. Well, oh, if a doctor tells you, if correct. a doctor tells you, right, well, you, you've got, you, you, you're going to have to amputate your left hand, Jonathan. It alludes to it in the book. It says doctors have, because the, because because patients have such a huge ability to gather data now. Apparently, better performing doctors have taken to saying. Here's the line of treatment I am going to recommend to you, and I think you should do. No, but let's just get back on to. I mean, I agree with you, but let's just get back on to where, where I, I, I wanted to talk about. So I think if you take my daughter, who's 15, in about seven years, she'll be a salesperson because that's just where she's going to end up. And she has had her head full of getting away from pressure. The whole young kids now are getting away from pressure. She said to me the other day, she said, uh, I, was, I was putting her under pressure, absolutely no doubt, to put her phone down and do her homework. She said, uh, I think that, that your pressure is now triggering me. Was she winding you up, though? I said, are you joking? She went, yeah, I am. I said, right, <laughs> give me your phone or you can't have it again. Do your homework. <laughs> but, but I think a lot of people believe that. She says it in like a parody kind of way. Well, look at that, that, that girl yesterday who was going on about her morning routine. Oh, I know, yeah. On LinkedIn, and I ripped into her about it. A little bit. I know, and her response was, well, Jonathan, you're welcome to your own opinion. It was just so sort It's so sickly. Sickly nonsense. But I think we're going to take a lot of the sickly nonsense that are now feeding into the world that's going to become sales, and your point is going to be they are not going to be directive salespeople. They're not going to be Gillian no, or I, Dave. I, I, or... But I wrote on page 39, I mean, the final part of, of what makes a good jolter is removing uh, risk. They take risk, take off, risk the off the table. Take risk off the table, yeah, yeah. But I wrote on page 39, customers are all going to start telling me in about a, a year's time that they want to hire jolters in, instead of challengers. And you're going to go, where from? Correct. And I've written, the jolters are going to be harder to hire than the bloody challengers. Of course they are, yeah. They're going to be harder to find. And I don't think they're going to be that easy to make. Not not from, mm, I think that's true of most sales books though, isn't it? Really what you're asking somebody to do is change the nature of what they do and learn. It's a bit like asking you to change your golf swing. You've had a million golf lessons. I bet your swing's quite similar to what it was. It's changed a lot, but my God, has it taken some Well, work. that's a fair point. But like it, like me, I'm not going to take golf lessons off somebody when I pick up golf. I might have one or two. My swing is going to be pretty much the one I had when I was 20. Yeah, I mean, I have. But you get my point. You, you won't it's... be... To, to make what would be an unnoticeable shift mm. to you yeah, and an enormous shift to me has taken monumental effort. And it's a pastime and you're not under pressure. So no, imagine, telling to a, for it. imagine telling a salesperson who's carrying 80 grand a month target, you know, a million quid a year. I want you to fundamentally change the way you sell. I want you to stop being as quite so consultative and asking the customer what they want. I want you to start telling the customer what you think they need. To a uh, 39 year old oh, that's been selling for 18 them, years. I want you to actually close them. Because that's what he's saying in the book that the top performers, based on the data, actually ask the customer for the business. The top performers, based on the data, actually turn around to the customer and they remove the risk. They say, listen, I know you're a bit worried about it, but here's what we're going to do. I'm going to move an army of guys in here next week who are going to set this project up. This is how we did it there. This is how we did it there. It's going to be all right. And I'm going to look after you and it will all go smoothly. And then what the really top boys will do and girls is they'll say, right, I want you to imagine this. Three months from now, here's where we're going to be. Your system's going to be up and running and you're going to be a hero. What does that feel like? And they're going to take the customer into a comfortable future place. Mm. And then they're going to say, so I'll get the paperwork raised. I need you to sign it. There you go. I think the vast majority of people are not going to either want or be capable of doing that. No. They're going to be even harder to hire. Yeah, yeah. It's going to, uh, 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 and I think, and it's like I said before, I think that there's the de as the technology for analysing performance, I mean, that's unprecedented, isn't it? 
the ability to actually, you know, for, like you said, footballers, they've got the game ready things on. You can see where they move on the pitch. The heart rate, heart rate, heart rate just everything. everything. Work rate, how many yards they've covered, soccer players, rugby players, golfers. We've, we've had data. Now we've got that same data to apply to salespeople. I think it's probably going to cut a significant proportion of people out of the profession. But I think it's going to make people hard to hire because customers are going to say, well, what we want, people who've got the natural propensity and capacity for driving it along. And getting to your point, they're not doing it in interviews. No. So when somebody actually goes, closes an interview, the client goes, oh, wow. Right. Maybe you might jolt a customer out of his indecision. Yeah. Maybe you Because he's might... jolted me out of my indecision. Yeah. You don't seem to be moving forward with this. Yeah, I don't understand actually, why. Actually, the volume of people closing in interviews is at an all-time low. They never close. And it's mad because it's supposedly their job. But they don't think it is anymore. But I think we've spent too long telling them they need to be consultants, not closers. Now, let's talk about chapter three. Judging and decision. Like that. Do you know, I think the You're chapter... very... I've written here, MP is really good at that. Oh, Thanks. That I think that is w one of your superpowers, Pricey. <laughs> Cheers, Johnny. It is. Uh, I do. I think it really is. M m listeners, Michael can smell a customer that isn't really buying from 2,000 miles away. Well, you know I have some good clients, and you must be sat there thinking, why is it not working on that? Mike gets these clients where you look at it and you think, enterprise software vendor, just looks brilliant, kits are sexy as fuck. Everything can't about be asked it, calling him. It's everything about it's right. I go, Mike, you don't seem to do much work about that. No, I can't be asked. What? Can't be asked. That's I'm, actually I'm, what I, I say, in fairness. I, I, I'm dealing with client X that's uh, got 200 employees and sells hairy arsed manufacturing software. Why? Because they're buying. Thank you, Johnny. And it is the case. Because they're buying, Johnny. And they're going, they're going to hire a salesman and the client is decisive and is going to get on with it. And it's you're true though, isn't it? mega at that. Me, I get all giddy. Oh, Enterprise Client X, I went to their offices. You should have seen it in the reception. Kids well, I playing never go to the client pong. offices, do I? There were kids playing ping pong. It was so cool. Yeah, great. They didn't spend any money, Johnny. Oh, it's only a nine interview process, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'll tell you what I was going to say about this chapter, actually, is I think the theory of judging the indecision is a brilliant theory. Yeah. I really think this is this is a brilliant chapter. You know, when it comes to valuation problems, rest should ask themselves uh, how, how to determine lack of information, how to determine outcome uncertainty. There's a four-step process that uh, any sales post person can use to assess a customer's indecisiveness. Brilliant. Just brilliant. I just don't think any salespeople have either got the time or position to actually or do nuts. it. Or the nuts. I think they're going to do it. Again, it's so, I think... The theory is brilliant. The theory... And what they're saying is that the data is very clear that the salespeople that succeed, the, the data is very clear that they are very good at working out and focusing on customers who are going to make decisions. Goes back to the initial point, doesn't it? Those who have got paid a problem to solve. But it's not even the problems to solve. They're not judging that. What they're judging at, what they're actually questioning is, are you actually going to buy something? So could we be clear are you going to make a? Are you a decisive human? That's what you're very good at. You just spot the customers that are just going to get on with doing a hire, where actually they make decisions. That believe it or not, do you know what they are? Decision makers. D what what three letter an acronym? Um, am I going to use money, Oof. authority, and need? Yeah, but your point is take money, authority, and need. And then on top of it, add somebody who actually is a decisive person. Yes. they. And what they're saying in the book is that the statistics clearly show that these higher performers are very good, not at qualifying customers because the customer has a pain. Mm. They're not, it's not about... But that's step one. It's step one. What they're actually good at and what they focus on in their pipeline, customers who they know are going to buy something. Because that's your point, I guess, about the client that you're speaking to later on this afternoon... He is definitely the man. I'm not being sexist. Money authority need. He's def <laughs> He's definitely the yeah. man, isn't he? He's definitely mm. in charge. He, he has, has the money. He, he he has the capacity to turn ring up HR and say, please issue an offer letter to the following individual. But your point is, uh, he got into a point of indecision because he was worried about the risk of doing something. He's a new VP, new to the business. 
high risk that yeah each hire is high risk his boss is fairly new and as a result, the business became quite indecisive in its hiring. And actually, they rejected a lot of candidates. Now, were they rejecting candidates or actually are they being indecisive? It's a good question, Johnny. Actually, I think they were being indecisive. Actually, they were finding reasons why not to hire. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree with you completely. Because the candidates you had in there, like the ones that were unsuccessful, <laughs> I was like, quality. what? He's... They were coming up, they were finding objections. Ridiculous ones, Finding really. them. Like they'd... Right, give me a minute. I need to think of an objection. Yeah, because like you were putting ca candidates in front of them who had super stable track records, and I don't like hooky track records, and I know people don't like me for saying that, but if you've got a bad track record, it's because you missed target. Whereas if you've got a good track record, you hit target. Somewhere along the line. And it doesn't matter how you do yeah. it, you hit target. Yeah. And actually the clients, so it's a bit of a segue here, but when the clients are whinging about the candidates, for whatever reason, I feel like saying, yeah, but that candidate has had three employers in 15 years, in new business sales roles, why are you bothered? They find a way of doing it. Yeah. Whereas your client was going, it was trying to find a reason not to do it. And so in, what? In an absolutely. impeccable track record. Absolutely. And so what they're saying in the book is that actually a key facet is that ability to just smell a customer who's going to go, yep, I got a problem. Yep, I got to fix it. And yep, I am going to buy something. Well, it's interesting. So let's talk about. A I'm going to evaluate, and I'm going to make a decision. Because I had, a, I've got a client who you know. Um, I'm not going to mention the technology because it's quite a narrow market. And they briefed me a while ago, and you said, "Mike, why aren't you working on that?" I said, "Because he just drags his heels." And then you said, "What's going to happen?" I said, "At some point, he'll phone me, give me a hard time, and put a rocket <laughs> on my ass." Yes. <laughs> and, so, and about two days ago, you rang and said, "Guess who phoned me and put a rocket at my ass this morning?" Yeah, but do you know what? His decision, his indecisiveness, his status quo it clearly goes on a journey of some kind doesn't it it briefs yes he, he has goes, a problem he goes through a mental I mean, we talk a lot don't we about customer journeys yeah he, he's buying or he's, he's indecisiveness or status quo journey or whatever it just changes and all of a sudden it snaps he's buying strategy I, his methodology i said in four cvs it's all subconscious isn't it as well i said in four cvs yesterday I, I logged on my email this morning. First email I got was from him at 5.38. Can I see candidate X and Y at times? He wants, to, he wants to meet Offal. Right. I guarantee when I switch my phone on, because it's on on airplane mode, he will have called me and texted me. I just got that. that. But that's all of a sudden he's in that zone, isn't he? Yeah. He's now decisive. He's gonna. He now wants to get it done. And just that capacity to spot decisiveness. Mm. But again, how do you hire for that? How do you hire for that? How do you hire for that? Well, you use us, obviously, because we know what we're looking at. But, you know, beyond that, I mean, how do you interview for that? How do you search LinkedIn for that? You don't. You don't. Then he goes into, he talks a lot that, one of the things I disliked about the book is, could have been a lot shorter, as with a lot of these books. And they've padded it out with lots of quotes of Daniel Kahneman and lots of behavioural economics. Actually, I sometimes wonder, and maybe this is part of, what's going on in the world we're all a bit accelerated i mean i listened to this as an audio book at two times speed whilst i was on the uh, on the peloton two times speed <laughs> but i can listen to it but that, i think that says a lot that we just want the content and well we we're learning to speed read yeah it's mad yeah um uh, and there's lots of research and uh, and it's padded out it could have been a white paper so what about chapter four then your recommendation the more options you put in front of a customer, the more they want to hit the pause button. I've got to say, we see that so often in recruitment. Oh, you put six candidates in front of a client, they'll often not hire anyone. You put three candidates in front of a client, they'll hire someone. It's a big problem for me with the, with the, with the clients when they've met somebody and they go, oh, I'd just like to see a few more. They get interview fatigue. I say, well, do you actually want to hire the one you've got? Are they unsuccessful? Yes or no? Oh, it's not like that, Mike. I need some comparison. I always say, why do you actually compare the candidates to your needs? Uh, I've got your job what, brief What here. we see in recruitment, I don't know whether how this affects the technology space or any other enterprise sale, is if they see too many candidates, they just begin to compare candidate with candidate instead of the candidates with the initial pain and need. Yeah, sometimes, let's get it right. Sometimes we get it and right. And often, actually, the initial pain and need wasn't that well defined in the first place. So I've just had a place. So then what you've got is a client comparing candidate with candidate against a pain and need that they didn't really properly fully understand about their own business anyway. Do you know what's interesting? I've just placed a, uh, a guy with a company. And um, and then what do they hire pricey? 
before you tell me about that. Then they hire the one with the shiniest looking CV in the end. Oh, they just hire the one that's worked for the competition. Yeah. I mean, it's pathetic. But that's what happens. So you've just placed the candidate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so this client briefed me about a year ago. And at the time, he was really nice about it. At the time, I said, what's your average order value? How are you going to... Standard questions. And it just sort of fizzled into nothing. And this time around, I met him the other week in Leeds, told you. Uh, and I went to see him. He went, do you know, he said, I came back to you because the first time I briefed you and you asked me loads of questions I didn't know the answer to, I felt a bit embarrassed that I hadn't thought about it. Really? And he said, that was the reason I called you back this time. And I said, uh, and, and when he called me back, I just sort of, I, when he first briefed me, I thought, yeah, no money here, I'm moving on. And then he'd call me and you go, have you got any candidates? And I go, nah. And he said, I know what you did first time. You sort of bid me because you thought I was wasting time. He said, do you know what I did? I went, no. He said, I hired somebody that didn't work out. Did he? Yeah. And I said, uh, why do you think you did that? He said, because I didn't really know what I was looking for. And he, and he was really polite. And you know I'm terrible with compliments. Um, and, and he said, that initial conversation was the reason I called you back. And when he called me back this time, I said, listen, I, I, you know, thanks for calling me. I'm surprised you didn't. I, was, I didn't think it ended particularly well last time. And I'm surprised you called me. And then this all came out after we'd made the placement. So it's fascinating, isn't it? Yeah. I, I, think what, I think what the salespeople don't do enough, they're, not, they're terrible at, really, a lot of them, is asking questions that put the client on the spot. I know what we do. I know you do it better than me, actually, in recruitment is. They'll go, it's a new business role. You go, right, where are the leads coming from? Well, they come from marketing. How many of them come from marketing? How many leads do they need? What's your conversion ratio from lead? Yeah. And you get stuck into it. And, I, and I've noticed years since I sat in on a client appointment, but I can imagine it happening where the client's sat there going, stop asking me questions. I don't know the answer. Stop asking me questions. Well, I don't part know the, the art is just stopping just before the customer sat there wanting to throw you out of the room, isn't it? But what happens with you is you really polarise the clients. Yes. Sometimes they speak to you once, never speak to you again. <laughs> but I'm not knocking you. But 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 like the ones that really buy into you, like this, this company that you're dealing a lot of work with where you've got the sales enablement thing at the minute, you are that client's recruiter. I yeah. just defy any other recruiter to get into it. They'd struggle. But I think the salespeople need to be doing that. The salespeople need to be need to be really drilling into um, the client requirements so they can really understand the client briefs. So then they can limit the it's exploration. Because the book doesn't say that, though. The book actually, I think what the book's really saying is, yeah, 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 everybody's doing great discovery. But actually, the ones that make the ones that are making money tell the customer what to do. They don't do as they don't do as much with discovery. The statistics are saying depends what actually, statistics, depends what statistics you've what, gathered. The, but the statistics they've gathered mm. in their study over thousands of calls recorded and analysed through machine learning, their stats are saying all this stuff about doing great discovery and really understanding the customer needs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's table stakes, mate. Actually, people who sell stuff they tell the customers what to do and then they ask them for the business. Fair enough. And then they and then they employ what later on we'll talk about in the book, which is radical candor. So and this is my, this is why I think it's game changing is because it's such a paradigm shift. It's an enormous paradigm shift. This against what everybody thinks is the conventional selling methodology. Be consultative. Listen to your customers' needs. Don't talk much in a meeting. They're saying actually, statistically, the really top sellers talk a lot. Oh, the Americans will be fine then. They talk a lot. Apparently, the top sellers in make the have engaging conversations where the ratio of conversation of client to salesman is actually much more equal. There's a a banter and a and an exchange. Now it's very interesting that because I look at I record a lot of my calls on HubSpot. I've never done it. I, I do it because it's just a really easy way of because uh, I'm lazy. Well, I might do, do you know this. why I do it, Mike? Because when I'm doing my 15 minute intros to candidates. I can record the phone call in HubSpot and then it transcribes the call and then I don't have to make notes. So then I can just pace around my office, hit puts, walk around, stare out the window and I don't have to make notes anymore. But what's really interesting is it gives you a statistic of how much they've spoken versus what you've spoken. And actually I found myself, even on job specs recently, I've noticed I'm talking less and less and less. Right. But they're saying, actually, I should be talking a bit more, engaging the customer in conversation. Bear in mind, though, we sell to salespeople. Yes. I doubt this analysis is done on salespeople selling to sellers. I'd be surprised. So, but, chapter four, offer your recommendation. Tell them what to do. Yeah, good. Tell the customer. Not everyone can do it, and decades of sales books and trainers have told us it's wrong. Decades of sales trainers have told us it's wrong. Decades of sales trainers 
and sales books and sales thinking and sales methodology have said, understand your customer's needs and explain to the customer how your solution is a fit. And then if the customer doesn't buy, go back and help them understand it more. But actually, cold, dirty, hard data, mm. big fan of it. The cold, dirty, hard data says, actually, no, tell the customer what you think they should do. Be credible, be somebody the customer trusts, and then say to them, this is what I think you should do. If it was me, this is what I'd do. I'd buy this, and this is why. And actually, the customer's more likely point. to buy off you. And that, whew, that's nice mental. That. Nice that. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I do agree with you completely. I am, um, yeah, I completely agree with you. Here you go. This is the stat. This is nuts, this. When we look at instances in which customers are experiencing low levels of indecision, wait for this. We see a 240% difference in the win rate when recommend skills are demonstrated at a high level compared to a low level. See figure 4.5. But techniques like those we've discussed in the chapter produce a natural lift in any scenario, not just the easy ones. So... I mean, a 240% difference in win rate when people are using recommended skills. When people are actually saying to the customer, this is what you need to do. That confidence and assertion that we've been knocking out of salespeople for the last 25 years. Oh, actually, that, that confidence and assertion that we've been knocking out of salespeople for the last 25 years, well, the ones who've still got it are 240% more likely to close something. Johnny, I feel like I'm in a courtroom where you're just nailing me. <laughs> I mean, you've got a fair point. That's nuts. If the numbers, if their stats are right. We have to assume they are. Why would they be wrong? I, I, I can't imagine they would be. I mean, these are people that have run some pretty big studies before. Yeah, 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 completely. Um, so I, that whole offering your recommendation. And then, then they talk about limiting exploration, Chapter 5. What did you make of this? Uh, I really liked it. And it said... Uh, analysis of sales conversations reveals three skills that high-performing salespeople use to limit the exploration. Owning the flow of information, anticipating needs and objections, practicing the radical ca uh, candor. Now, we, I, I was actually a chapter ahead of you before when I was talking about this with the, with, with, with clients. Um, what, what This is using our own example. So I've got a client at the minute who are in the people tech space who want a pre-sales person. Um, and what we've done thus far is... The client really wants somebody from one of from one of a number of companies, and we've said, right, these are the companies, these are the number of prospect candidates that are in there. Yeah. These are the number of people that meet that criteria. And let's say there's a hundred. Um, so your choice is we either get somebody out there, or then you change the job brief. Yeah. The client goes, I don't want to change the job brief. That's fine. That's what you need. Okay. So then you've got to stay in that. So if you're gonna hire somebody from that, you either pay what you're paying. Or you pay more money. Because if you're paying what you're paying, you're not getting a very big response rate. The client goes, oh, I want to pay exactly what I'm paying. I said, right, okay, well, in that case, you're not a client for me. <laughs> I've got to qualify out. Yeah, I'm not, I've, I've, I, you're not a client Can't anymore. Can't be done. You're not a client anymore. I'm not going to do it. Um, that was on Monday. Still waiting for him to call. Now, let's hope it happens. But point being is, that's very much here, like owning the flow of information. I, I think... It's back to your point about we're asking too many questions sometimes and going down too many little rabbit holes. Too much choice. Yeah. There's, it, it, I think it's later on in the book, he alludes to, they talk a bit about travel agents, which is fascinating. So when I was a little boy, I remember my mum and dad used to go to the travel agents at Moortown Corner. And I remember dad would have a good quarter or a good month at work and he'd say, Saturday, we're going to the travel agents. And the travel agent was your sole source of information. And the whole family would go down the travel agents. That's cool. And dad and mum would look through brochures and they would talk to the lady behind the counter and we'd book a holiday. And dad would turn around and we'd go to Disney, kids. Because in those days, dad was a cash money watchmaker. He had plenty of cash in those days. And then the internet came along and we all made our own decisions. And then what they're actually saying is actually we've got to a point, and this is bonkers, which is now, and he alludes to it later in the book, if you do like a search on Italy, it comes up on with about half and 500 million different blogs. And if you do a search on best places to go to in Italy, the volume of information is such, it's just 
you cannot drink from that fire hose. I completely agree. You just go somewhere else. So much data, so many reviews, so much TripAdvisor, so it's many mad. vlogs. It, I, it puts me off Amazon. And so actually what's happening is people, apparently, the travel agency industry is back in growth mode. Who would have because thought that? people, interestingly, Gillian and I use a travel agent recently. We've booked several holidays through a travel agent. That's cool. Where we've said to her, where she rings us and says, what do you want? Well, like, for example, it's our, 50, our 20th wedding anniversary this year and we're thinking of doing like a big American road trip. We will get Lisa, the travel agent, to do that. Get ChatGPT to do it. We're no. going through the Canadian Rockies. Oh, yeah. I've asked ChatGPT to do me a route from Calgary to Vancouver, taking in Banff. It said you should follow it. These you should follow this route. Bam, 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 Amazing. Bam, bam, bam. I thought this was so, good. So that's the point. The I, point I, they're I, making is they talk about controlling this flow of information, and what they talk about what's really interesting is apparently one of the things they found statistically is the top sellers relied on solution engineers and pre-sales. I was going to say that. Were well, you going to say that? Sorry. High performers in our study were less likely to cede control of the conversation to others inside their organisation. Specifically, we found that top sellers relied less on subject matter experts like solution engineers, product leaders and customer success managers in their calls than, than did the average performers who tended to bring in subject matter experts much earlier. I mean, that's really interesting for our sector. Really I've got a client, Mike, uh, that I'm working with at the moment. I've got a second interview there next week on a government job. Uh, they do analytics stuff. And interestingly, when I, I did a series of interviews with all the hiring managers, uh, the, 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 the MD introduced me to all the different hiring managers for all the different jobs. And he explained to me before I met the this particular hiring manager, he said he's an interesting one because he was a pre-sales guy. And he does all his own pre-sales. Right. I said, what do you mean? He just does it all himself because he can't be asked. By the time he's rung somebody to do the pre-sales work on it, he could have done it himself. So he does it all himself. The guy was 300% to target last year. But why? Because he sat in front of the client and he just sounds like an expert. And he's saying to the client, this is what I think you should do. So we've got a lady who works for us called Joe who does my research yep. in lots of cases. Is it easier for me to do the research or her? He's a little bit of Chinese whispers oh, between tough. her and I. It's tough, isn't it? We're talking about this. Now, she does it because she's doing a brilliant, a like an unbelievably brilliant job for a client at the minute. Like the client doesn't actually return my call, he just emails her. It's fine balance because me and you, I've got, I've got one job that's very You've complex. You've got a massive central gov job. That's very complex. The job spec's very complex. Can I delegate it? Well, I've tried and she's struggling. So, and the whole research team is struggling. And therefore, I'm going to have to be the one that does it. But actually, I'm horribly under-leveraged doing it myself, aren't I? Yes. I can only fill as many jobs as I've then, therefore, got the time to research for. And so, as a salesperson, yes, okay. You've got the top sellers rely less on other people in the sale, pre-sale, solution engineers... Other but, was that, but, but they're not very well leveraged. But they then become hugely under-leveraged, and I'm sure that must at some point, there must be like almost a balance to A bloody point. impossible to hire. And Imagine again, if your client wanted to try and replace that again, guy. Again, let's look at the job spec we're creating with the book. We, we, you know, in, in reading this book today, we're, we're rewriting the job specs that we get, aren't we? So the candidate must be assertive, radically candorous, honest, Capable of actually closing a customer and capable of telling a customer what to do. Oh, and yeah, I could do them really just do most of their own pre-sales because apparently that's what the top sellers do. Yeah, good <laughs> luck filling that, Johnny. Good luck with that, job I, I thought this point was a beauty. High performance are always on the hunt for signs of implicit non-acceptance. That is when a change in tone or slight pause on the part of the customer tells them something is amiss and the customer's not buying it. I talk to you all the time about change of cadence with people. This, it's just, uh, I, yeah. I always think we were going really quick, now we're going slowly. What did I say to you yesterday? Just We had a coffee in the Starbucks before we came in here, and I said to you, uh, I spoke to so-and-so so -so yesterday about Candidate X. He just seemed really cool with me. And he hasn't said anything different, really. You've just gone. We were really warm about this person. And the pace has just gone... And the pace has just changed. Like that. 
one minute it was all go 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 just need to meet the ceo go 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 and then all of a sudden i've not heard from him for two days and he was really cool with me on the phone no i said to you might be closing the deal whatever yeah could have had that, a bad day could have just lost a big deal that's been really, posi be really positive about it but my my gut feel immediately went something's wrong there. now what's different about johnny and i is johnny would call the client again me i just wrote it on my diary and move on you'd literally go mm, i can spend half an hour talking it through with the client or in half an hour, I can speak to two potential new client decision makers. I'll speak to the new two potential client decision makers. And Johnny will be there going, Mike, what about that? I'll go, yeah, whatever, I don't care. Whereas I'll ring the guy on the way home and go, do you know, yesterday, when I rang you, you seemed a bit cool me. We okay here? But I I will have radical candor. It's mad. I'm not saying... I will well, have the radical candor to say, are me and you good? What's that, wrong? And that's the important bit. I'll go, are me and you all right? And what's wrong? Because that's an interesting part of the book, you see. Cause and he'll go, mate, I just had a round with the missus. I'll go, oh, right, I just thought you were pissed off with me. Yeah, because that's interesting about the, about what my opening point in the book is. You will stick with him. I will just bin him and find somebody else. And neither of us is wrong. No. And I actually, you know, I, I always say I prefer your methodology. It's lower stress and lower pressure. But your point will be, but I've invested so much time in this person. But the just stick another one in the top of the funnel methodology is the least stressful way to live your life as a sales professional. Much less stressful. What's happening with that deal? Don't know. Book it's, it's, more today. Sus it's more professionally sustainable long term. Because imagine if you were a client and you, let's say you're my boss and I work for you and I'm worth selling cloud technology, Microsoft Cloud, whatever. And you go, Mike, his social shit's going to close. I go, yeah, I don't know, but I have booked four new appointments today with the following companies for next week. Correct. As I always say, the placements we make today are chip paper. Completely agree. Chip paper, we used to call it. And, and, it's and yesterday's it's, news. And it's an interesting thing about the, the placements book. we get today is six is news that took place six weeks ago. Because because I I don't disagree with the book, other than that opening bit of trying to change people's status quo. Yeah. And what is interesting is it's two different philosophies, which is actually, in most companies, they celebrate an actual signed win. Mm. You and I celebrate and get more giddy about new appointments. Well, who have I just new got client into? Appointments. Uh, uh, one of the largest global consulting companies in the world. Full stop. We actually, I don't know if you realise this, you and I get more giddy and celebrate more about booking top quality new client appointments than we do about when we actually 100%. put a placement on the board because we're a bit like yeah yeah, yeah that was done ages well who am i meeting tomorrow johnny client. massive company yeah just mega company but that's more exciting because it's just stuff in the top of the funnel and putting stuff in the top of the funnel makes for a less stressful life it's interesting because somebody we're connected to uh, and i do I mean, i'll mention him we're connected to sean maloney Known Sean, and I, I think Sean, if you're listening, I don't know if you do. I he really likes respect so much the guy. of my content. He, I, I, he, he literally, I reckon Sean likes every post I put out there. Me Thank too, you, Sean. me too, and I like his, and I really respect the guy. We've known him since a long time since, since we were kids. Since we were kids, Mike. And he put a post up, and I, I and I just read it, and I and I didn't comment because I didn't know how to comment in, in a nice way, really. And I'm not saying Sean's wrong. Sean's saying sort of don't worry too much about about having lots of opportunities major more on the opportunities that you've got now let's be clear he's got a very very successful track record top i've guy. been a very very good guy top guy and i read it and didn't comment because i thought mm, i don't know about that i've got something stuck in my funnel sort it out no nah, i've got something stuck in my funnel i'm just gonna get something else i think there are words that you use in your own mind as a salesperson i'm just thinking about this whilst we're talking it's easier to have radical candor and it's easier to be bold when you've got more in your pipeline. Well, I know somebody who listens to the show. We had this conversation on Tuesday, uh, whatever day it is, two days ago now. And he said to me, he said, he phoned me up and he's like in charge of it all. And they don't talk about that here. And, and I think that's missing. And he, and he goes, book. Mike, why don't you send me more candidates? I said to him, I've sent you nine candidates. You've not hired them. Either I'm now rubbish at recruitment or you're rubbish at hiring. Which is it? He went, ah, that's quite a good point, really. He said, which do you reckon it is? I said, you're now rubbish at recruiting. He said, no, I'm not. I said, look at this candidate. And it's a candidate he knows the name of. And I went, your sales manager doesn't want to meet him. He went, really? I went, yeah. Now, interestingly, I could have that conversation, A, because I get on with him very well, but B, like you say, because I just put the phone down and just phone something. Because you've, you've generated loads. I still want one of the clients. You, you can do it because actually you and I have 
absolutely levered it on activity generation for the last six, seven weeks. Yeah, don't phone me back. I don't care. I'll just deal with one of my other yeah, clients. Yeah, you don't want to work with me. I don't care. I might as well tell you the truth. And your, that's your point about if you've got lots in the funnel, you can say whatever you want. So then they're saying, yeah, the top sellers have got radical candor. Okay, so you've got two I bet big the top deals. sellers had the best funnel. Correct. And that's missing from the study. Yes. Because actually, imagine that you've worked all year on one deal that's worth 2 million ARR and your target's 2 million, and there's two months left of the year, and the customer's just not quite coming over the line. How easy is it? when actually that's the only thing you've got in best for you, to have some radical candor. And turn around to the client and go, listen, client, you were going really quickly before. You seem to have really slowed down. You're not talking to me as much. I yeah, just don't doing, get it. Are we doing this or what? I just don't get it. What's, What's going on? What's I, going on? I think you should do this. Yeah. Are you going to do that? What's going on with me and you? You've gone cold on me. Why? And I think his, the study here is based on people who've probably got good funnels, who are probably yeah, able I, to have radical candor. I think that's mathematically an enormous missing factor in the study is what was the volume of activity above what's in the funnel at the point at which the client becomes indecisive easy to have radical candor easy to tell the customer what to do easy to close when you've got loads in the pipeline do you want to buy it or not no okay no problem anyway i've got another deal i've got working by i get it with candidates they're going to take a job uh, i don't know well just tell me uh no i'm not right no problems i've got to go they go oh, well mike i really want to say i really enjoy working with you yeah, I don't care. Yeah, we're not mates. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's so true. And I do think, just debating it, I think that, just as we talk about it now, what a fascinating thought, which is it, it, it would have made the study perhaps too complex. But it's a fascinating thought, which is, okay, so these guys that are full of radical candor, these guys that do tell the customer what to do a little bit, the ones that are capable of actually, well, I'm only going to work on the ones that, well, a decisive I think that a lot of that I think you're right I bet if we really looked at it it would be underpinned by high volumes of activity 100% now I'm, I obviously get my film and actors wrong because I'm terrible with this kind of stuff but Al Pacino Glenn Gary Glenn Ross is that right have I got those two Tony Romy yeah oh I got it right <laughs> I, can't. I think Whoa. that's the name of the character my wife would be absolutely amazed but what do you reckon he did he just well, I, I'm sure he would have gone yeah I just went to get another lead Whereas the guy sold, I don't know who it was, sold a deal to the old couple and he was telling Tony Romer Shelley about... Levine. Yeah. Uh, and and he scene... sells to the little old couple and everybody yeah. goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. They buy for everyone, mate. But then, Tony Romer was go. nice to him because he was a nice person. Well, he was a nice lad. He was a good salesman. He was kind. Anyway, so chapter seven, can we... Do we have to go through take risks off the table? We sort of discussed it. We've kind of talked about taking That's risk good. off the table so and the way the good chapter ones Chapter seven, become a buyer's purchase. agent. Yes. The but... only reason today customers have reached out to a salesperson, and I don't interrupt me here. The only but... reason today, the only reason today's customers have reached out to a salesperson when they have many options to purchase on their own without the sales involvement is because they are struggling to, that they need help. So I just want to cover this. The only reason customers have reached out to a salesperson that tells you a lot about the book, and it tells you a lot about pipeline. The Go only on. reason the customer has reached out to a salesperson. I don't think the top sellers that this study is based on are waiting for customers to reach out to them. No. I think they are going and finding customers. I think they've got a bigger funnel. And I think that's why they're able to do the stuff that they're able to do. Yes. And I wrote that in capital letters in my notes. And then they, it, what was fascinating was they talk about this whole, you know, I was talking about the travel agent thing and how the travel yeah, agent... Yeah, 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 yeah. And what they're saying is that these top sellers are becoming like the travel agents in a noisy world where actually the customer can make a lot of decisions themselves. The top sellers are becoming like the agent where they're saying, right, this is the holiday you're going to have. This is what we're going to do. I now, actually, and I wrote something down in the column here. I wrote the word trusted advisor. <laughs> trusted advisor. They are trust. They become trusted advisors. After all that, I've pasted that phrase for a long time. I've always really disliked well, it. Well, I was speaking to somebody yesterday. You know who you are. Uh, and I sent you a, a photo of a book recommendation when we were talking who was telling me how much he hates the phrase trusted advisor. And I said, do you hate it? Or do you just know that very few people have the capacity to be it? And that's the point, isn't it? Everybody, what you hate about that, Johnny, is people call themselves trusted advisors when they're clearly not. Yeah, well, it's they. they it became... 
in the same way I am insistent this will become part of the sales vernacular in the next few years as it as it filters and trickles its way into the market. Um, a couple of key phrases trickled and filtered their way into the market over the years we've been in recruitment. One is trusted advisor, which well, predates... Yeah, when you had like some 23-year-old who'd been doing the job six months, some oh, trusted, trusted advisor. advisor. Yeah. Uh, which predates uh, Challenger. And then when Challenger came out, Everybody referred to themselves as a challenger, most of whom had never even read the book or done the training. Completely agree. Um, and actually, that phrase, trusted advisor, I can't, we've, we've covered the book on the show. I can't remember who wrote it. That phrase, trusted advisor, actually, I think now is, based on this research, very relevant. It is, but how do people do that? There's very few people who are capable of actually doing that. Again, it adds to a recruitment nightmare, which is... A level of expertise, and they do allude to this in this whole concept of becoming a, a, an agent. The, the, they allude to it. It says here, in many respects, there is nothing more central to being a salesperson than asking for a sale. However, it often surprises sales leaders when they learn their reps, reps do this far less often than they think or hope. And I'll go on to the closing bit in a minute. But what they're saying is actually that level of expertise, knowledge, and ability to advise like that who has that? Experienced people. Mm -hmm. Really experienced people. People who've been in the game a long time. Well, that's why people use you and I, isn't it? Because you've just been around the market and know Correct. what to do. So therefore, if I've got to have all these personality facets and these capacities, I'm just making the candidate pool smaller and smaller and smaller. Here's a stat for you. In our study... Reps, reps actually ask the customer for the business only 46% of the time. Uh -huh. This means that in more than half of all sales conversations, not only is there no confident close, but there's no actual discussion of a sale at all. But sales leaders would be misguided by assuming that the fix to this issue is to get their sellers to ask for the business on every sales call. The more accurate interpretation of this finding is that in more than half of sales opportunities, salespeople haven't earned the right to do so. So they're caveating it a little bit. But let's go back. Reps actually asked the customer for the business only 46% of the time. How mental is that? I'd like to have the start on how many people try and close an interview. Way less. 5%. 5%. Fair enough. Um, then they got to the, it, then the you, book goes on to talking about customer loyalty. Uh, uh, yeah, I, was, I only wrote two lines next to that. But what they talk about is quite interesting. They talk about post-purchase behaviour, which was quite interesting, about how actually the good sales reps manage that. But a lot of that is structural in the organisation, isn't it? Well, what, one of the, I only wrote two points down on this. One of them was customers who express hesitancy and who need to be wrestled across the finish line are the same customers who later recant their decisions, invoking cancellation clauses and asking to be let out of their agreements. Amazing. There's no, well, there's no surprise there, I don't think, is there? No. I twisted your arm to take a job. You took it and then you didn't turn up. Well, how can I be surprised? I've done that before. I've twisted a candidate's arm who didn't turn up. I don't bother. I just say, well, do you want to take a job Many or not? years ago. I don't even get into it. I don't even get into persuading the candidates. Where I've could, uh, many years ago, in my early years, where I've... Well, Jackos was built on that, wasn't well, it? Howard Jackson was built on that, cajoling people into taking jobs. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Cajoling customers into hiring people. That was what that whole business was based on. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then we got into how much indecision's costing you. I I thought this was like their sales pitch to us, really. Yeah. Uh, and I wasn't I wasn't so keen on that. Um, what did I put here? I put something really interesting. I, I put here, using they, they, there's a chapter on using conversation analytics to gauge the impact of indecision. And I just want to go back to the conversation intelligence thing. Um, I've got a couple of customers that are using role plays in interviews now. <laughs> yeah, I had one customer that actually hired actors what a, a, what a ridiculous client that was. And then they went out and hired people who were garbage. They hired utter muppets in the end. They hired Pre absolutely presumably they muppets. Hired actors. Presumably they hired actors. But, and this is my point, I quite like the idea of seeing a demonstration of skill. I, I, I like it. The only thing it does is it puts candidates off the job that might have gone for it. 
But the good candidates don't get put off. They just go, yeah, whatever. I'll yeah, roll whatever. With it. I've got the skills. I'll be fine. Yeah, yeah. I think role play, that if I was to design an interview process, it would have them in it. So now imagine that we've got, and this, this kind of technology has been around, but I think where we're going to be in a year or two is this technology is going to be 30 quid a month, not 30 grand a month. And every customer is going to be able to do a Teams call for final interview with a role play brief, record it, and then use machine learning analytics to judge the extent to which somebody's a jolter or not, or a, a jolt effect person. I think a lot of candidates have been successful. I mean, the implications of that for companies trying to grow. Separate conversation, isn't it? I said this to somebody who's trying to grow a company at the minute. I said, and, and, and we'd been out, we'd had a couple of beers. So, you know, sometimes people are a bit looser after a couple of beers. And he said, yeah, I'd just hire people that are 60% to target. I'd take that next year. Well, um, but that's often pe the people who talk like that are often business owners. So, 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 so can I just cover chapter ten? I wrote two things down initially. Um, the first thing great jolt sellers do is to make sure the inbound caller is in fact a viable buyer. In our data, typically sixty to seventy-five percent of inbound sales calls or chats with customers who express clear intent to purchase right at the beginning of the conversation. Mm. Inbound is my problem there. Inbound. How tell you many what, clients do we have where they have actual inbound lead flow? Well, let's look at it another way. So let's it say it tells you that the study skewed on large enterprise software vendors with big marketing teams. Where with people, big marketing teams and inbound inbound call volume inbound requests. Yes. So if one of our clients was to say, "I want to hire a jolter," I'd say, "All right." So you want to hire somebody that's used to managing inbound leads and then managing the sale is that what you want no mike it isn't well because that's what it says the data is based on chapter 10 have you read the book obviously you'll lose loads of people uh loads of clients saying that but um so let's say johnny right a, a software company we've never heard of um there's a plant there that i don't think is real so it's called plant software <laughs> plant software phones up and goes, nah. they're not real are they plant software phones up and goes hi johnny we've found you on um google we're looking to hire 10 salespeople. Right. Okay. That's great. Thanks for calling me. What are you paying? 90K basic. Great. Ooh, happy days. Brilliant. How many of the recruits have you briefed? Six. Great. Okay. Um, I suggest you choose one. I'm going to persuade me to be that one. And if I'm not that one, if I'm one of six, I'm not interested. Got to go. I wonder whether that's part of this qualification process. Because if you're ringing SAP for ERP, you're probably going to ring Oracle, SAP, you know, all of it, aren't you? Are you going to do the beauty? I think the, uh, the, and that's the, the problem beauty with, parade, and that I think it. is the problem with inbound leads. So a lot of these study here is based all on our inbound leads are all, nearly always shit. Nine times out of ten, yeah. Our inbound leads are nearly always shit. Why? Because if it's an inbound lead, they've made they're an inbound lead for more than one supplier. They didn't have a recruiter that they knew that had been pestering that they could they could go to start with, or or a relationship with somebody that they trusted. Now, referral, that's different, but I'm talking web search based Oh, leads. yeah, web inquiry. Hi, I'm looking to find a recruiter to solve our recruitment problem. And it's gone to six other agencies. Yeah. So, and, and then part of the problem that creates indecision is too much information. I think inbound leads are always going to have a lot of information. They research your website, they've looked at the clients, they're always yeah. going to have a lot of information. Yeah. Um, and, and, and you're more often than not dealing with somebody who isn't a decision maker. Who therefore can't make a decision? Who is going to be indecisive by nature? And and this is really important because, you, so I've got a, a meeting with and, a massive uh, company on Thursday. That is so bloody hard to get that appointment. But I tell you now, no other sales recruiter in England's got it. And you're talking to you know on this concept of he's customer, the, ma he's the, the managing concept, director. The cus this concept of customer indecision. Yeah, you're talking to the a managing director who. You're talking to a decision maker. And they don't talk about that much well, in the What book. do we do about I said to him, what do we do about T's and C's? He went, send them to me. I'll sign them. How many you know, they, the, one of the mentions they don't mention in the study is in how many deals where the customer became indecisive, was the customer not a decision maker? They don't. You're absolutely right. I'd love to know that. Actually, what are the numbers where Okay, great. X percentage of clients become indecisive and the seller becomes indecisive. Yeah, okay. 
well, to what extent was that person capable of making a decision? Were they actually the decision maker? And, it, and there's no mention of that in the book. There's I no mention. Of, I, haven't, I haven't even thought about that. There's, you... there's no mention of well, he was, who are you selling to? Technical buyer, user buyer, economic buyer, the economic buyer. And it's almost like, oh yeah, let's forget about that whole concept of uh, buying influence. How strong an influence are you in the account? So come on, Johnny. We're nearing the end of the show. We I think we're ha- done. Jolt Go. effect marks out a ten. I am going to say it's a six. And I'll tell you where it loses points for me. It loses points that I've said a million and one times, find people who are buying. That's a real massive problem for me. If you're trying to influence somebody who's not in pain, who's maintaining their status quo, you are talking to the wrong people. Find somebody that is. Um, the other thing... Well, no, that's unfair. That's my, That's the main point I dislike. Things I really like about it is, is if you've invested a bucket load of time and now your client has gone slow for some reason, this is a very good framework. Can't in any way dispute that. Very good. Very, very good. Good starting point. If I was a salesperson and I was involved in a big sales campaign right now and I was sitting on my bike at the weekend thinking... This is a brilliant Pick this book up. Pick it up. And the statistical analysis is excellent. Excellent but wanting. Yes, and I didn't like the challenger... And I didn't want to like this when I got when I, when I started reading it. I much prefer it to challenge a sale. Mm. I think it's a much better framework. So I'm going to give it six out of ten. Should people actually buy it and read it? Yeah, definitely. But please think about whether people have actually got a need. So I'm saying six out of ten. What are you saying, Johnny? It's missing a few things for me. One uh, doesn't account for pipeline volume. Well, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's a major problem. And as we've said and have thought it through today. Actually, it doesn't cross-reference these great sellers with... Actually, what did they have in the pipeline? What was the pipeline coverage? I agree. Because I think my gut feel is, I bet the the great ones all have big pipeline coverage that enabled them to be a little bit more radically full of candor and tell the customer what to do and actually close. Easy to close when you've got a big pipeline. Mm, mm, mm. Two... um, it doesn't talk about, it talks a lot about client indecision, but it doesn't talk about complexity of the sale, the complex sale, and the level of actual buying influence. It alludes to it slightly of the top of salespeople qualify whether the customer can make a decision or not, or is a decisive person. But what it doesn't quite go into is actually the concept of selling strategically and making sure that you're influencing the right people. Yes, I agree. I feel that's really missing. But in fairness, that's what this book's about. Three, I think it will create for me and you and for the sales profession some big change. I think everybody's going to be talking about it. Everybody's going to misread it. Lots of of people won't read it. Everybody's CV is going to say, I employ the jolt effect to ensure maximised win rates. And most of the people who haven't read the book. And what it's going to create the most is a candidate shortage just can't see that. I just can't it, see it, that. Because people are going to want what they can't have. Can't see people that. People are going to say, I want a salesman that closes, and I want a salesman that, that challenges, and I want a salesperson that's going to tell customers what to do. Yeah, well, there isn't that many of them out there. I completely mate. disagree. I think if a client makes reference to the jolt effect, I'm going to say, all right, so you want a salesperson uh, that's good with inbound leads where the statistical data is based on people who've got inbound leads in a full pipeline. Is that what you want? I'll tell you now, that's what I'll say. And if they want that, I should bin them. You'll just bin them. But the customers are all going to talk about it. Well, good year for and a them. half from now, every job spec you get, in the same way that now lots of job specs we get, yeah, it can do it, must be a challenger. Da, 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 da. I think it's going to have a bad influence on it's, it's going to make it harder to hire good people. It's a very influence, uh, interesting, the challenger thing, because I think of one company in particular. I think the challenger thing is a really. It's a red herring. But I don't think it's that. I think it's a mid market amateurish thing to say. Yeah, it is. It's really. It's a I think the really. To say. I think the really top sellers. It's the daft thing to say of a customer who hasn't thought through what they really want. I, th- I think. The, I think the, the 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 top salespeople. I don't think they're bothered about challenger. I think the top salespeople naturally do it anyway, as the book in fairness so said. My marks out of ten are seven. I think it's going to be a very influential work. I, don't think, I think it will influence a lot of other similar work, 
and the fact that they've used such a data-driven approach is going to spark a big change in the way we sell and we're going into an era of so I, the, the actual content itself mm, the idea that we've now got this amount of data and we're going to have that much data going forward for me it's exciting and terrifying that we're going to have so much influence over how people sell and so much very clear knowledge of what does and doesn't work more clear than we've ever had and that's fascinating so for me it gets a seven for having been a little bit groundbreaking fair enough well that's it i mean that's a long show that but we've had plenty to talk I've got about to say, yeah it's been very good for conversation there's no doubt about it lots to talk about and at that we say thank you very much if you've enjoyed it make sure you share it like it whatever. i'm irritated by people who listen to this and don't share it does my nothing why would you do that because we actually have to work quite hard to do it. I've I've actually had to I've listen had to, read, to the audio. I've had to read a six out of ten book. I've had to listen to the audio book, then read it, then make notes on it. I tell you, it's a bit like right. It's a bit like LinkedIn, where you put a post up. Literally, all people have to do is click like. Yeah. Why wouldn't Share. you do that? Anyway, we love you. Goodbye. Bye.